welcome to Secrets of a Victorious Mind. The goal of this live chat series is to introduce you to the wisdom, philosophies and methods of people that I follow and admire to live a life that I truly love. Today we have with us a very, very special guest who I'm extremely excited about. He is my personal favorite because I've read most of his books, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, The Greatness Guide, The Leader Who Had No Title, and of course, the very famous, The 5 AM Club, which is currently also one of his best-selling books in the world and most widely read. His books have sold over 15 million copies in over 92 languages. Can you believe it? Making him one of the most widely read authors alive. He is a globally respected humanitarian, founder of the Robin Sharma Foundation for Children, a non-profit venture that helps children in need lead better lives. He is also known as one of the world's top leadership experts whose clients include many Fortune 100 companies, famed billionaires, professional sports superstars, music icons and members of royalty. Isn't that fantastic? Let me welcome the rock star leadership guru, Robin Sharma. Okay, let me get him on. Waiting for him to join. Okay, I don't see him joined yet. Ah, yes, it is. It is something I've been waiting for so long. I can't even tell you how happy I am that he accepted this invitation. Still waiting to see him come into the live room. Robin, where are you? Here he is. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation to Secrets of a Victorious Mind. I'm truly honored and it's a privilege to have you here today. Thank you so much, Arthi. It's, it's nice to meet you. Happy to be <laughs> with you. I, I can't tell you how much I love your books and everything that you've said in your podcast, your videos. That information is uncom it's irreplaceable, it's uncomparable, it's unbeatable. Sometimes I wish I could go into your brain and actually just bow down for the things that you've said. They're so profound. Oh, if you went into my brain, there's not as much in there as you might think, so... <laughs> That's good. I guess that's why you come up with such profound stuff. If there was too much noise, it probably would be very different, right? I think so. I think so. Con congratulations on all your success. I know you have so many followers and, um, you, you know, it's, it's great to be here. I, I've had, uh, I, think you're, I think you're based in uh, both India and Aust Australia. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I'm yeah. in Perth right now, Western Australia. Oh, I've been to Perth. I love it. It's, it's, uh, it had such a, it had such a peaceful vibe to it. That's true. That's what I told everybody when I came here. They were like, how is the shift? Because Bombay is so chaotic, even though I love Bombay, but this place has a different frequency altogether. It's like you're in constant meditation. Yes. I really loved Perth. And of course I love India very, very much. And the, the, uh, the readers of my books in, in India have been, beyond supportive so especially with the 5 a.m club um the, the, res the response to to that book has been pretty stunning for me and i just finished my i finished my new book two weeks ago so it'll be i know out, i'm uh, so excited yeah. to know about that that's gonna be one of my questions to you but you can tell us about it now since you're also so excited about it oh that was a very hard book to write i i wrote it i started it uh last february essentially one month before the world fell apart. And uh, I started writing it in Tribeca in New York. Mm -hmm. And then when everything went silent, 
I, st I stopped traveling, obviously, and I, I basically lived and breathed this new book, and it's very personal. I, I talk about my own struggles and my own fears and my failures, and it's, uh, it's an interesting book, Arthi, because it's, it's, a, it's part memoir, it's part elite performance, which I've been teaching for a quarter of a century now, and yet it's, very, it's also metaphysical and spiritual. There's, there's just a lot to this book. So I'm, I'm excited uh, for it to be published in India and around the world over the coming months. We all can't wait for it too. And uh, most of the times I like uh, self-help books. But when you read a self-help book, it just tells you, do this, do that. This is good for this. This is good for that. But what I love about your books is that you add a story angle to it and there are characters. So you, you know, hear the different voices and then, you know, you speak through one of the characters and give your wisdom. So, you know, because there's so many thoughts pe that, you know, people uh, think of when they're reading a book, but they don't have all the answers. Through your characters, you actually answer all those questions. And that is why I love your books. Well, you know, I think you make, you make a very good point, Arthi, because no one likes to be preached to. No one likes to be told, you know, do this. And, and also, I don't think people learn the best and grow the most when they feel that there's this perfect guru teaching them. And so in my books, I, 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 I always say I'm, I'm not a guru. I'm, I'm a person who's flawed and talented, hopeful, and sometimes discouraged. And I think that's the human journey. And in the 5 a.m. club, I, I tried to share this methodology about rising with the sun. You probably know this, but in India, they, it's, it's Sanskrit, I believe, and they call it um, Brahma Muhurth, yes. Brahma, Brahma Muhurth, the time of Brahma. And so the say, in our culture, right, the sages would get up because of the vibration. And that's why... Many of the most productive people, creative people, spiritually evolved people. It was actually, from what I understand, Brahma Murtha, four to six in the morning. One and, and a half hour before sunrise, I think. And it's called the time of creation, they say. The time of creation, exactly. And our meditation is deeper. Our reading of the holy books or, or wisdom books is deeper. Our prayers are deeper. So... I spent four years writing the 5 a.m. club to create, to share the methodology that I've been teaching with many of the world's most successful people, billionaires, athletes, on how to get up early, why to get up early, and then exactly how to do it along with other, once you've got up early at 5 a.m., you've joined the 5 a.m. club, then what other habits should you include in your day to be more positive, more productive, more, more peaceful, focused. more focused. I mean, we live in a world, the age of dramatic distraction, and many people are suffering from fragmented attention disorder. And if you can't even sit down and read a book or focus on your focus on a conversation for even 10 minutes with the with the fullness of your cognitive bandwidth, then how are you going to do genius level work? And so many people, sure. because of social media, they they can't focus and geniuses all have one thing in common. They can spend extended periods of time in isolation focused on one thing. That is so true. Um, I grew up hearing early to bed, early to rise makes you healthy, wealthy and wise. But your book reinforced it with a method and that is something that stuck. Because uh, we all know we should get up early and sleep early. But that first hour after you get up, that is the key. And I love the way you call it the victory hour. And you've broken it into the 20, 20, 20. And I'm sure a lot of the people that are watching have already read it. But for the ones who haven't, to hear it from you will be amazing. So please tell us a little bit about the 20, 20, 20. And why is the first hour called the victory hour? Well, first of all, Arthi, I want to give you a sincere compliment. Uh, I, I love it when an interviewer is smart, well prepared, and enthusiastic, <laughs> and so that that that's it's such a pleasure for me. So you're you're absolutely right, G. It also has the philosophy, because 
some books have philosophy and then you're saying, okay, great. I love the theory. How do I execute on the theory? Other books are very tactical, but then you could be tactically climbing a mountain, but it could be the wrong mountain. So in my, in the 5M club book, and even in my new book, I, I tried to balance philosophy because philosophy is which mountain? With the and method. Then, with the method. So yeah. philosophy is what are you, what's life about? What is success about? What is true wealth? What is living a soaring life? That's philosophy. We, we need to know the philosophy because that's which mountain to climb. And then once you know which mountain to climb, you do need the method because that'll help you go from base camp to, to your Mount Everest. So you're right, in the 5 a.m. club book, there is this concept I've introduced called the victory hour. And what I'm suggesting is rise at 5 a.m. And then I, I mentioned the research of University College London, which says it takes 66 days of repetition to install a new habit. So what most people do is, oh, I want to join the 5 a.m. club. I've heard about the book. It's grown into a movement. I want to get up early to find more peace, productivity, exercise, pray, meditate. But they, they try it for a week or two and they experience the difficulty and then they say, well, I guess it's not for me. In the book, I say all change is hard at first, messy in the middle, beautiful at the end. All change is hard at first, messy in the middle, beautiful at the end. If it wasn't difficult at first, a new relationship is difficult at first. Before you run the marathon, you get, a, get, get off the couch. It's difficult That's at first. That's why you call the first 22 days deconstruction, right? It's, it's, so there's a, mo there's a model in the 5 a.m. club that's, that's called the habit installation process. Exactly. Three stages, 66 days to get to automaticity, where you get up at 5 a.m. automatically. But you've sure. got to go through the first 22 days, dismantling your old you, the middle, installing it, and then the last part of it, integrating it. So once you've done it for 66 days, not five days, not 10 days, stay with the process. This, the 5 a.m. club and the method I teach in the book is life changing. It's, it's helping millions of people right now. So what do you do once you're up at five and, and you're getting in the routine? You're right, it's called the 2020 formula in the book. The first pocket, five to 520. Exercise. Sweat it out. And, and you must sweat, you're right, because sweating releases BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor, which actually yeah. optimizes the brain and accelerates your learning. Powerful. Sweating in the morning releases dopamine. That's the inspirational neurotransmitter. We all need it right now in this world. Sweating first thing in the morning releases serotonin, which makes you feel happier. Sweating in the morning releases um, norepinephrine, which actually gives you focus. I could go on. And but reduces the, cortisol and all of that. So your stress is taken care of. So Cortisol is exactly, Earth. the cortisol is highest at 8 a.m. in the morning. So you get up at 5 a.m., you work out, cortisol comes down. You just feel much more peaceful even if you're having a bad day. Now it's only 5, 5.20. That's the first 20 minutes of the 20-20-20 formula. It's 5.20. You feel fundamentally different because the way you feel when you first wake up, even if you feel miserable, isn't the way you have to feel 20 minutes later. Second part of the 20-20-20 formula is reflect. How many people in this world are busy being busy? Take the, time, take the time at the beginning of their morning to write in a journal, to remember their values, to think about how they want to be remembered in their funeral, to meditate, to pray. Powerful. So you do that for 20 minutes. Now it's 540. Last part of that I teach in the book in a lot more detail. It's grow. I mean, the leader who learns the most, who grows the most wins. The, all the billionaires I mentor, they have one thing in common and all the professional athletes. They are obsessed with outgrowing who they were yesterday. So 20 minutes to listen to a podcast, to write in, a, to, to read, to listen to an audiobook. Now it's six o'clock. You've optimized what I call in the book, the four interior empires, mindset, heart set, health set, and soul set. You, your day is going to, 
even if you have a hard day, it'll be so much better. And your day, your days are your life in miniature. Each day, as it gets better, you, you create a much better life. Right. So actually, also in your other book, The Leader with No Title, you mentioned each of us is born into genius. On the other hand, most of us die in mediocrity. And you reiterate that in the 5 a.m. club. You say the old you must die for a better you to be reborn. And you just spoke about being reborn. So, you know, heroes, titans and icons have traits and habits that average performers don't show. What are these traits and habits that people who want to go from mediocrity to genius should take up? Oh, there's so many that I talk about in the 5 a.m. club. One I would say is you can make excuses or you can change the world. You can't do both. When we were born, we, we had such a sparkle in our eyes, Arthi. We, we wanted to be astronauts and poets and philosophers and chefs. And then the world, you know, sometimes it's our parents, sometimes it's teachers, sometimes it's the media that says the great human beings, the great artists, the great business builders, the great movement creators, they're different from you, Robin and Arthi and everyone. They wants. suppress you, yeah. Well, they suppress our genius and then we become sheeple versus people. And then we wake up at 25 or 35 or 45 or 85. And we say, mm -hmm. well, what happened to my gifts and my talents and the life I thought I was going to build when I was a little kid? So the habits, the 5 a.m. club is a huge habit because that is a morning protocol every day or five days a week where you work on yourself, where you remember who you are, where you turn down your ego and become stronger by reading, prayer, meditate. This morning, I'm no guru. This morning, I, I, I ran on the treadmill. I did a little bit of stretching. And then I write in, wrote in my journal about what's working in my life. And then the man I want to be. And if you do that kind of work every day, hmm. you, you incrementally become braver, more authentic, more you don't productive. care more productive you don't care what people think and and so we can become much stronger and the insight really is it's not about transformation it's about remembering who we were before the world told us to disbelieve in our genius so true because i've uh, been acting most of my life ever since i was a kid i did ads i did films then i started direction i studied direction but I've constantly felt this calling, you know, I don't know whether you'd like to call it motivational speaking or just, you know, sharing positivity. I feel it so strongly. I can't not do it. And then I have people that ask me, oh, you stopped acting. You gave up direction. You did a little here and a little there. Now you're doing a little bit of this. And I'm like, you want to judge me? That's your problem. I'm still going to do what I feel, you know, driven towards. Right. You were a lawyer and you didn't like what you were doing. I read about it, you know, that you, you just didn't feel satisfied. So you could have chosen anything. What made you choose this, what you're really doing? Such a noble thing. Um, well, thank you for saying that. I really care about my readers. I spent four years writing the 5, the 5 a.m. club. I've spent 18 months on this new book and it's it's I love what I do and I suffer a lot doing it. Did you know that the root of the word passion is to suffer. Yeah, I read that in your book. Right, so I'm not, writing this new book, I, I rewrote it maybe 20 times. Uh, wow. You know, three weeks ago, I was given 387 pages to review after 18 months on the book, and I didn't skim it. I, re, I, I forced myself to look at every line so it was calibrated and beautiful enough service. So. I love what I do, but it's not easy. And I take it, I take it really, really seriously. But why did I leave law? Well, there's a line in the 5 a.m. club that says instinct is more powerful than your intellect. Yeah. So, you know, Indian, by, I'm Indian origin, it's doctor, lawyer, engineer. I became, I became a lawyer. Because intellectually, it's what I was told, taught to do, and I was told it will make me happy and successful and whatever. But what's the point of being successful in the world and disliking yourself? And so 
I, tr I had this, when I was late 20s, I had this intuition, this instinct to mm -hmm. write a book. And I self-published it. And everyone laughed at the title. It was called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. When people said, no one will ever read the book. It's a, a foolish title. I thought it was Mega Living. I thought Mega Living was your first and then Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Right? You're right. You're right. Mega Living was my first book. And then I did The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Thank, right. you, for the, thank you for the correction. I just, <laughs> so many people know the monk who sold his Ferrari. So, but uh, Mega Living was my first book. Then I did the at monk Kinko's. who sold his Ferrari. I did Mega Living at Kinko's and the monk at Kinko's. So, both were self-published. Which your mother edited. <laughs> you know more about my life than I do. <laughs> I read so much about you. I can't tell you how crazy I am about everything, you know, your books and all about you. You are you are so well prepared, which is another thing I talked about today, a gargantuan competitive advantage. So few people are prepared. We want the results of world class, but we don't apply the habits of world class. In the book, I talk about superficiality to granularity. Yes. And you're, you're, you're giving an example. It's like so many times I'm interviewed and people haven't, they haven't prepared, they haven't even read the book. And, and then they wonder why it might not have been their best interview. So we, we can all be over prepared. We can all take our work seriously and see it as our craft. Our work, whether you sweep streets or run a country or run a Fortune 500 company, our work has dignity. Our, our, on this new book I just finished, my, my, my family, my father's name my, my good name, as you say in India, your good name. <laughs> you know, we don't say it here in North America. In India, it's like, what, sir, what is your good name? But, but is, it is your good name. And so by your, everything you put out in the world has your name on it. And I right. think it's really important. So I left law because I was, I was empty. And what's the point of making a lot of money and losing your soul? I'd, ra I'd rather have my soul and not make any money. That's but well. you could have chosen anything. I mean, you gave up law because you didn't like that, but you had so many choices and you chose this. Why did you choose this? What, what was that thing that drove you to be a writer, speaker, teacher, whatever, I mean, leadership guru or whatever you might want to call it. I don't want to give it a title. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's the whispers of the heart versus the chatter of the ego. So many of us don't spend any time in silence anymore and we're addicted. And look at social media. We're addicted to what other people think. We live in a culture of comparison. The billionaires I work with and mentor, the, the, the athletes, the movement makers have one thing in common. They do not care what other people think about them. That's they the have, toughest. They have a vision to launch an app or launch a business or write a book or do a screenplay. And everyone is laughing at them. You can't do it. That's a foolish idea. They don't care. So I listened to that poll that said, write this book. I loved learning about successful people. I started writing this book. And I, I have to be completely honest with you. I believe instinct is spirit. Call it God. Call it spirit. Call it destiny. I think we all... We, we have to exercise responsibility and do our part. Get up at 5 a.m., be good people, do excellent work, don't make excuses, stay fit and healthy, etc. We must do our part, but we get to co-create life with, call, say, God or call it spirit or the universe. When you open and you trust life versus control life, Life leads you to the most magical of places. Life is, life is so beautiful. Even in, even in my life when I've suffered, I look back now and I see how necessary the suffering was to open a door to take me to the biggest blessing in my life. What was that? What what suffering or what uh, adversity did you face that made you feel that? Oh, I've, I've, I've had a lot of difficulty in my life, you know. Will, will we have to wait for your book to read yeah, all about yeah. it and how you, you came you, out of it? You, you have to read the new book to, to know. <laughs> um, you know, without getting into the specifics, 
I'll give you one example that I write about in the new book. And it's, there was a period of time, a number of years ago, where 10 years of my personal journals vanished. What? And, you know, imagine having to deal with, and that was like a relatively minor thing that I've experienced. And what I've learned is life doesn't work for your failure. Life works for your favor. And a bad day for the ego is a great day for your spirit. So the ego says, look at the world right now. I mean, it breaks my heart what's going on in India. And, and I mean, we're all suffering right now. And yet, good, good will come from this. And we can actually use the trauma that we're all experiencing right now. And rather than blaming and, and saying, you know, I can't wait till this is over. This is such a bad time. Imagine if we work with the adversity and notice the feelings that come up of helplessness and fear and insecurity. And they wouldn't come up. And then feeling them and processing them through to release, you're actually going to use this difficult time to develop wisdom, increased creativity, higher vibration, lower inflammation, longer immunity, more positivity. Like work with difficulty, befriend it. In the new book, I call it hugging the monster. When you hug the monsters, you actually use trauma for growth. There, there's a term we all know, yeah. po post-traumatic stress. You know what I'm mm. interested in? This mm. other term, post-traumatic growth. Wow. Right. You also said in one of your podcasts, you know, where you said, wear your wounds, uh, you said, wear your scars proudly and transform your wounds into wisdom. Make your stumbling blocks into stepping stones. And you also quoted Khalil Gibran and you said your favorite book, The Prophet, he says, difficult times come to you to crack the shell that covers your understanding. So considering the struggle, the adversity, the loss that people are facing in today's day and age, how do we make this the best, worst time of our lives? It's, it's a brilliant question. And you mentioned Khalil Gibran and the prophet. And, and I just want to recognize his work. As you know, he was a, a Lebanese poet and he just, he did such beautiful work. And there's actually a chapter in the prophet and it says, and I'm going to paraphrase it. He said, the same self cup from which you drink your wine was burned in the potter's oven. And so the phoenix rises in the flames. That's the name so, of my production. Sorry. Really? What, what's <laughs> yeah, the name rising of phoenix. <laughs> there, there you go. I mean, that's the, the phoenix. It, it emerged in the flames. And that's, that's heroism. Nelson Mandela became Nelson Mandela on Robben Island, not before he went into prison. Mahatma Gandhi became Mahatma Gandhi, not faced an empire. Rosa Parks became Rosa Parks that day on the bus when she was told mm -hmm. to go to the back of the bus. So we can step into our heroic nature in difficult times. How do you do it? There's so many things we could talk about, but a morning gratitude practice, again, part of the 5 a.m. club method that I teach in the book, it tells you exactly what to do to battle-proof your mindset. But, you know, I know this, this chat that we're having is, seek, you entitled it Secrets of the Victorious Mind. Yes. Not to be confused with Secrets of Vic, the Victorian Mind, which would probably be a very different conversation. <laughs> but, but in the 5 a.m. Club book, I challenge the dominant thinking that mindset is everything. Right? Because you hear that so much, like mindset is everything. But my, our, in the book, I say, like, our mindset is incredibly important because that's our psychology. We need, we need a healthy psychology. We need to rewire our beliefs and our self-identity for elite performance, more pro productivity, better success. I agree. But there's a model in the book. I don't have the 5 a.m. club in front of me, but it's a model. I have it. I have it. It's well, right if, you can, if you can find the four interior empires, it might be 
if you can find that model, it might be helpful to your viewers. But the point is, mindset is only one empire, in internal empire to work on at 5 a.m. And if you want to live an incredible life, mindset, we have- Heart set, have, soul set, health set. Mindset. And I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted to actually ask you about this. It was my next question that everybody talks about mindset, but nobody talks about heart set, which is your emotional intelligence, your health set, which is your physical, you know, how fit you are. And then your soul set, your connection with the Supreme. And you've said it so beautifully. But the most important thing is, how is your productivity connected with your heart set, your emotional intelligence? This is the missing link to elite performance that very few people talk about, mm -hmm. right? Everyone talks about mindset is everything. But if your mindset is says, okay, here are the habits of productivity. But your heart set, that term I introduced in the 5M club book, yes. if your emotional life has been traumatized or if you have been heartbroken and you've repressed it or you've been brought up and you feel a lot of shame or you're full of anger, mm -hmm. then you're going to sabotage success. That, people don't talk about this. They say mindset is everything. But if you have a, a positive mindset, and, and excellent beliefs, but an emotional life full of sorrow, anger, resentment, you haven't forgiven all the people who've hurt you. You're gonna have low energy, you won't be able to execute, you're gonna be blocked from your creativity, you won't be inspired. So it's mindset, it's heart set, and then the third interior empire I talk about in the book, health set. If you don't have high cognition, a healthy brain, lots of energy, then you won't be able to execute on your ethical ambitions. And then here's something very few people talk about, fourth interior empire, soul set. A lot of people say, I wanna build a billion dollar company. I wanna be productive. I wanna <laughs> be a great actor and I wanna build a, Robin, come on, you know, what do you want us to do? Hold hands and sing Kumbaya, you're talking about soul set. If you want to change the world, you do it from a place of soul. The world yeah. is in so much trouble right now because people have lost the connection with their souls. Greed, yeah. be people became greedy. People became polluted the environment. People forgot that we're brothers and sisters on a little planet. So soul set is nothing spiritual, really. Soul set is connecting with your truest nature of wisdom, love, courage, humanity. And if you work on mindset, heart set, soul set, and health set, those four interior empires every morning at 5 a.m. for one hour, just imagine what you're going to do in your career and in your life. Unbelievable. Just reading it charges me so much. I'd be like, oh, I'm going to get to something. <laughs> it just charges me. Reading a book is like, you know, you put your phone on charge. It's like putting me on charge. Great. And I think everybody who reads your book must be feeling like that. It's just that they don't get a chance to tell you this. So I am representing all those people that have read your book. Thank and you. let me tell you, we all feel so charged and so, you know, like raring to go to start something. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so um, coming to the fact that you've been a speaker at so many large organizations like PwC, FedEx, Oracle, HP, Nike, Microsoft, GE, and even NASA, and you've even mentored so many billionaires. Of all the self-made billionaires that you've mentored, what are the three things that fire them with positivity in a way that has pleasantly surprised you? Wow, what a great question. Thank you. I'd say number one, many of them have a chip on the shoulder. Many of the billionaires I've mentored didn't get a lot of applause from their parents. And so even though they might be 40, 50, or 60, at some level, they're working relentlessly and building their empire so that they're good enough for mommy and daddy. Really? That's... They want that appreciation from home. Oh, how many people actually received appreciation from home? Very, very few. 
So that would be the first thing. Most of the billionaires I've mentored have a chip on the shoulder. Some of them were bullied as kids and they want to prove themselves to the world. The downside of that is nothing is ever enough for a lot of these people. So they've got a billion, but someone else has 168 billion. They have a, a yacht, but they want a bigger yacht. And that becomes a hamster wheel. And I work with them to help them get off the hamster wheel. Second trade of the billionaires. As I mentioned, most of them could not care less about what people think about them. They don't care. And many of them, like it's, they're, they're like closet pirates. Mm -hmm. They don't care what other people think. Because most of us, we're tribal, aren't we? We have a, a, a biological and sociological, sociological instinct to fit in with everyone. It helped us not stray from the tribe and get eaten by saber-toothed tigers in the primitive era. But now we it's still do, instinct. It's a survival instinct. But right now, how are you going to be authentic, start your, do your own thing, live your dreams, et cetera, hmm. if, if, if you have this deep need to fit in with everyone else? So second thing is they don't care what other people think. Third thing about the billionaires that really inspires me, these people are monomaniacally committed to growth. So you tell most people, go read the 5 a.m. club. It'll change your life. Or, or go read this other book that like, here's a book I read in the pandemic, The Splendid and the Vile. It's about Winston Churchill and how he navigated World War II as the prime minister after May 10, 1940. Great book. Here's another book I'm reading. Magnificent Desolation. S second man to walk on the moon. He talks about what it was like uh -huh. and his journey. The billionaires I mentor, you tell most people, go read this book, and they'll go, oh, yeah, 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 and then it's playing with the phone. Not judging, just, uh -oh. re just reporting. You tell a billionaire to read a book, and the book is read within days. They love learning. They understand that the best investment you can make is in your self-development because as you grow more, you can do more, you can achieve more. And they also, it's not only self-development, personal mastery. These business titans understand that the marketplace pays for magic rendered. Mm -hmm. So most people go to work and they push average. They're average, yeah. right? They just do average work. When you work at your craft to the point where you push magic, like Picasso, like Elon Musk, like Steve Jobs and the Apple products back, you know, the marketplace pays you for that. And these billionaires understand that. So the best thing you can do is develop your work on becoming a better person. That increases your income and your impact. Right. But what really makes them feel like what fires them with positivity? Changing the world. Changing the world, doing good service, right? Well, I have to be honest. Not all, of, not all billionaires I've mentored want to change the world. Steve Jobs did. I didn't, I didn't mentor him, but some of them do. And a lot of them just want to make a lot of money and be famous. But, right. but it's a very empty victory because no one has ever made a lot of money and then woken up and said, I'm the happiest person in the world. Most people want more money. So there's nothing wrong with making money. You can do beautiful things for your family. You can be, help people in need. But if money is your God versus your servant, you're going to, I think you're going to be very unhappy. Right. Right. How much do you think willpower comes into play? Because in one of your finest books, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, I love the way you say this and it's changed things for me. You say lack of willpower is a mental disease. And you also said that procrastination is an act of self-hatred. <laughs> it just tumbled my whole world. And every time I can't do something, I tell myself, shit, I don't have the willpower to do this. Am I something, is something going wrong? I have to gather the willpower to do it. I cannot procrastinate because do I hate myself? No. So they have been very transformational for me. And so I want to know what is this unknown zone and how do we increase our willpower? So Arthi, 
I wrote The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari when I was a much younger man. <laughs> I wrote that book. It was released. It was first released almost 25 years ago. Right. So I've, I've, I've evolved and 